Hadi Chahadi, uh, who is a longtime friend of mine and of Techonomy's, um, who is a multifaceted business person uh, and uh, public policy veteran, um, who I'll tell you quickly his little, his bio. Uh, he, he's a serial entrepreneur um, who uh, started a number of companies very successfully. Um, and then, uh, I forget what year it was. What year did you become head of ICANN, Fadi? 2012. 2012. And you ran it for a critical four-year period, uh, which was really a, a triumph of diplomacy. Uh, ICANN being the global organization that manages the naming system of the internet. Uh, but it, under Fadi's leadership, it was extracted from the US Department of Commerce and no longer came, was under the control of the United States government. Um, and that is, I think, a real uh, asset for the world right now. We'll get to that again a little bit more in a moment. But uh, the, the, the internet has been genuinely in jeopardy uh, then and now, and Fadi uh, has essentially saved it one time. Uh, he'll give us his thoughts about where it stands now, I hope, before we run out of time. But meanwhile, he's now running something called Ethos Capital, which is an, a business that is a private equity firm aiming to really invest uh, on ethical basis. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit, Fadi, about why you're doing that and what responsible private equity means and how it contrasts with the way private equity has otherwise historically been practiced. Thank you, David. And of course, the subject here is how do we get from the fallen star of the private equity world to the North Star that Zainab just did such a marvelous job describing. Uh, it is true that private equity deserves some of its reputation uh, of being sometimes more focused on returns uh, than on the well-being and the success of all the stakeholders involved. Uh, and so in very direct and simple terms, uh, I'm tired of speaking about it. I left my private equity firm in Boston, a very venerable and honorable firm, but to create a firm that is very focused on surprising the stakeholders we serve with a different approach. And I love the word surprising here because I think most people don't expect the money types to do the right thing without being prompted to do so by a law or by a policy or by public outcry. Why not get ahead of it? So the purpose of Ethos Capital is to invest in mid-sized companies, but most importantly, uh, to actually direct these investments from the start with a mentality that says, how can all of us rise with that investment? And we're going to do this in very practical ways, David, that I'm happy to touch on if we have the time. Well, uh, I mean, talk about some of the practical ways. And, and, and okay. one of the things that, that I do think we did discuss in our, in our prep was that in a time of data centricity, uh, when data is the core lifeblood of more and more companies, an ethical and responsible and stakeholder oriented approach is even more urgently needed because the perils of failure or irresponsibility are in effect greater. Would you agree with that? 100%. Every company is now a data company. Uh, I'm currently in the process of uh, looking at a company that does home alarm monitoring. You know, do they ha really have data? Of course they have data because home alarm monitoring is no longer just putting a sensor on your window. It's actually putting a camera on your door. It's having multiple cameras in your house. It's watching your mother who's aging in place. All of this data is in the hands of the company that is monitoring your home from burglars. But could the company itself be a burglar of your data? And how do we get ahead of that? How do we not discover that our TV is watching us or the cameras in our home are watching us and selling that data? Why shouldn't we, as owners of those companies, make them from the beginning assume the responsibility of the dignity of the homes they're in and establish policies and accountability mechanisms that provide assurances to the public that when a company is in your home, it is respecting your home and is treating your data with transparency. If we apply that to company after company, and bring together 
all the stakeholders involved and make sure there is respect. I'll give you a very specific example on that. As I'm looking at this company, an ins a large insurance company approached me. They said, listen, you're gonna have data on a couple million American homes, high-end homes, that could be very useful for our underwriting activities. And I said, but I, I, I just can't hand you that data. I, I mean, they said, the most we have is a drone going above the house and checking the roof. You're gonna know if a water leak is gonna happen in this house months before it, anybody discovers it. You're gonna know how often are people using the kitchen. You're gonna know so much about this home. Can you give us this data and we'll underwrite the policy? And this is a stark example, but just to tell you that every business, whether it's in healthcare or in home monitoring or in education or in financial services, will have so much data and we must become responsible for this. We cannot wait for policies to be drafted in Washington. Because as David, you and I discovered, most data is not national. It is not bound by the same uh, circles that the law in circles. Data is transnational. I could be pulling your data out of your home to Honduras, and then I'll follow the laws of Honduras, whatever these are. Meanwhile, you live in Kansas. We must give the companies the opportunity to take leadership. And I'll finish on this point, David, on your question that for long, as a CEO for decades, I felt the responsibility rests with CEOs. And uh, Zainab brought that up, business leaders. But I must tell you, as I, I built more companies and now I invest in companies, it, an even bigger responsibility rests with the people investing in those companies. Because we're the right. ones sitting on boards of directors. We're the ones paying the CEO. We're the ones telling him what returns he or she must give us. And therefore, if we wash our hands, which we've done often, of the responsibility we have to create the guardrails and simply say, when the government comes at you, let's make sure we have enough, frankly, lawyers to ensure that you're compliant versus let's get ahead of the governments. Let's mm -hmm. show leadership. So that's why we're building this. What, what about the next layer of investors, the investors that you raise money from? And I know you're raising money now in some very large amounts to buy some more companies. Um, are the, in, the institutions, the pension funds, the endowments, are those kinds of organizations themselves feeling they need to invest in more ethical uh, investment opportunities? Absolutely. They weren't two years ago when we started thinking about this, but now endowments, university endowments, pension funds, even sovereign wealth funds. We just saw Norway last week put some very strong regime around uh, the, the money they're putting to work and ESG standards. So everyone is right now waking up to the responsibility of the investors. We can no longer wash our hands from this. And frankly, if an investor says, look, this may ding a couple of IRR points from my base case because you're going to put an AI technology in this company and you may make 5,000 people redundant. And I'm telling them if this is happening, I need to build into the base case exactly how I'm going to help these 5,000 people make their next step in their career. And there is cost to that and we may need to bear it. And therefore maybe we will take slightly less returns. And remarkably, David, people are responding to this because they understand it is time we all do our fair share in that. What's caused that change in two years really fast? Oh my goodness, it's everything we're seeing around us. The awakening. The Black Lives Matter movement, all this. Of course, stuff, pandemic, of course. Trump, all that, yeah. Of course, and the inequality that COVID has just accentuated in every way you can imagine. Uh, okay. Those of us who are living in you know, big homes have dealt with COVID very differently from those who have country houses and those who don't, and those who are packed in apartments. I think we live in a time when everybody is waking up to a responsibility. And I'm just, frankly, my partner, Eric Brooks, and I are just doing our part. We're saying, fine, we're going to invest with that spirit. Okay, I got two more things we got to touch on. 
Now, you got a, a little bit of hot water and a lot of controversy when Ethos tried to uh, purchase the public interest registry that runs the .org domain for over a billion dollars that would have gone to the Internet Society, but the, a lot of people objected. Just give your, you know, bottom, you, that ended, it's over, you were through. What's your overall assessment of that in, in, in summary terms? What happened? To be, fr to be frank, David, the gulf of trust in our economy and in our society between people has become just too wide. Uh, at the time I was advising ethos, I wasn't part of the firm yet. And I was watching, frankly, with great, uh, with a heartbreak, how little trust there was that the money uh, that will come in and enable certain things to happen will be put to good use and will do the right thing. There was no trust in that. And there was no, you know, uh, I, I loved the idea uh, that, uh, that uh, Zainab brought up, but also Arlie Hochschild from Berkeley speaks about climbing the wall of empathy to the other side. No one yeah. wants to do that climb. The gulf is so big, but understanding the other was very, very hard during that process. I learned a lot from okay. it, David. Uh, okay, let me I just hope, jump ahead. I hope we will break. I hope we will break that cycle with time. And my comment is that I think it's incumbent on the money people to show that, uh, that yes. before the, the other side. So you're, it's good that you're I trying. Agree. So thank you. I agree. No, I, I just agree. I, I, I want to make sure we touch on the internet quickly before we wrap because you really were a a visionary diplomat of the internet at a time when just. You know, right as you were starting to take over ICANN, there was a global meeting where a number of authoritarian countries basically proposed to more or less remake the internet around their own interests. You succeeded in putting, pushing that back. You also uh, were able to do this political thing I mentioned earlier of extracting ICANN from the Commerce Department. Yes. And one can only imagine what ICANN would be subjected to if Donald Trump effectively was in control of the internet uh, naming system today, I, I think it could have been quite uh, problematic. But even at this very moment, there is enormous pressure to splinter the internet into more fragmented form. Do you think we can hold this critical global resource together? It will be difficult, David, because to do so, we need to understand our common interest. And we live in a world where there's very little leadership to actually highlight the common interest. The way we were able to convince China to stay with the one logical infrastructure of the internet was frankly to arrive with Premier Li and his team to a clear understanding of the common interest we all have in one logical infrastructure. But it started there. To create common interest, you need to do many of the things leaders do, which is to engage, to listen, to find that common ground. Now, we in China have diverged since on the cyber front, and it's become harder and harder to find that common interest. When I was doing it between 2012 and 2016, that gulf was huge, and I spent literally four years to try and get that gulf closed until the U.S. gave up certain things and the rest of the world accepted a common uh, infrastructure. I believe uh, moving forward, uh, that will depend immensely on the leadership in those two countries. Uh, if okay. the leadership in those two countries would like to break that infrastructure, they will. And they can. Yet another element, yet another element of the future of the world that hinges on a very near-term election here in our country. Uh, for, to a large degree. Listen, I have one more question for you uh, from Andrew Torgrove, um, who I know is, in, is a financial person himself, somebody who I know fairly well. If, if the owners or managers don't share the ethical imperative you're talking about, how can they be incentivized to act in, in more ethical ways? I think that's a, it's a really important question. You know, for you, as if you're a board member, I mean, is it just you, you lean on them? I mean, what happens? How do you do it? We, from the beginning, are making this a tenet of our investment. And we are bringing on board, well, our, well, our first employee is a chief purpose officer whose job is to work with me and these managers from the start to say, here's the regime we're gonna put in place. 
So I'll give you an example. With this alarm monitoring company, for example, we would bring in from the beginning an actual council of privacy experts who would be, who would have binding accountability to the board of directors of the company. And they will be watching our data policy and auditing it with independent power. And if the company we're buying is not open to that idea, then we'll know from the beginning we have an issue. And for us, that will be a decision uh, as part of the overall investment decision. This is what we're doing differently. We're making it yeah. part of the investment thesis. And I know you're bringing in other really well-respected ethical leaders like Beth Novak of uh, GovLab, who's well known in civic tech for her yes. visionary ethical approach. Indeed. Body, thank you so much. Um, really great. Uh, so many things to discuss with you, so little time, but I really appreciate you being here and for being for having you as part of our community. Thank you, David. Thank Thanks you. I'm again. glad I could contribute.